Hello, welcome workers and friends. Welcome back to Working Class Revolt. I'm one of your hosts, Dust James. I'm coming to you live from my humble home in rural North Carolina. And as always, I'm joined by my great co-host, um, union organizer, brother David Fox from Australia. How's it going, brother? Uh, very good. And yourself? I'm doing all right. It's a lovely Saturday um, uh, winter evening um, out here, and we got a good study meeting in store for all of y'all. So, as always, um, if you're watching this on the YouTube, uh, share it out on the Facebook, share it out on the Twitter, post this wherever that you can post it, um, where everybody is interested in talking about socialism and a better future. Um, please share it there. Make this a bigger conversation. Please get in the comments. Um, get in the comments, and I'll respond honestly. Fair warning. I had some people get angry the way I respond sometimes, but I will respond honestly and open to any comments. Um, and we and we do encourage that because that helps the conversation along. So tonight we're going to be we're going to be continuing our study of J. V. Stalin, the foundations of Leninism. Um, we are on chapter eight, the party. Um, this is the this is a rather long chapter. This is the second to last chapter. Um, Comrade Fox, could you um, um, give a little bit of introduction on this piece? Yes. Well, th this part of uh, uh, chapter is about the role of the party, and it was it backdates right to the se um, Second International, but the pre-revolutionary period, uh, obviously of uh, before 1905, and the role of the Russian Marxists. Um, and their activities at and about the, through the foundation of the party. Vitally important uh, how the party came into being. And uh, it wasn't just some creation of someone who thought it was just a great idea, let's have a party. It, it showed you how the party depended on the material conditions, how it came into being. So that that's why to keep that important. And right up to uh, both the revolution and thereafter. It is a long chapter, so we'll I won't be too long on the introduction to that. So let's dig in, let's get into it. Mm. All right. Yeah. Um, like I said um, earlier, when I introduced this, Stalin has a very good way of speaking. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I got a working class background. I, I had a, went to a few years of college, didn't, mm. didn't finish it. And when I read Stalin, it's like, you know, he's speaking right to me. It's non, it's, it's, it takes all the academic fluff out of it. Um, it gets right to the point. It's easy to understand. It kind of reminds me of uh, comrade uh, Caleb's writing. Um, hmm. City Builders and Vandals, which I, I liked hmm. well. And I see kind of like an extension um, of this. So so without further ado, we're just going to get right into the text this evening. Yep. All right. Oh. Here we are. Stalin, the Foundations of Leninism, Chapter 8, The Party. In the pre-revolutionary period, the period of more or less peaceful development, when the parties of the Second International were the predominant force in the working class movement, the parliamentary forms of struggle were regarded as the principal form. Under these conditions, the party neither had nor could have had that great decisive importance which it acquired afterwards under conditions of open revolutionary clashes. Defending the Second International against attacks made upon it, Kotsky says that the parties of the Second International are an instrument of peace and not war and that for this very reason they were powerless to take any important steps during the war. During the period of revolutionary action by the proletariat, this is quite true. But what does it mean? It means that the parties of the Second International are unfit for the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat, and they are not militant parties of the proletariat, leading the workers to power. By election machines adapted for parliamentary elections and parliamentary struggle, this, in fact, explains why, and the days when the opportunists of the Second International were in the ascendancy, it was not the party, but its parliamentary group that was the chief political organization of the proletariat. It is well known that the party at the time was really an appendage and subsidiary of parliamentary group. It scarcely needs proof that under such circumstances, with such a party at the helm, there could be no question of preparing the proletariat for revolution. But matters have changed radically. 
With the dawn of the new period, the new period is one of open class collisions of revolutionary action by the proletariat of proletarian revolution, a period when forces are being directly mustered for the overthrow of imperialism and the seizure of power by the proletariat. In this period, the proletariat is confronted with new tasks, the tasks of reorganising all party work on new revolutionary lines of educating the workers in the spirit of revolutionary stru struggle for power, of preparing and moving up the reserves, of establishing an alliance with the proletarians of neighbouring countries, of establishing firm ties with the liberation movement in the colonies and dependent countries, etc., etc. To think that these new tasks can be performed by the old social democratic parties, brought up as they were in the peaceful conditions of parliamentarianism, is to doom oneself to hopeless despair and inevitable defeat. If, with such tasks to shoulder, the proletarian remained under the leadership of the old parties, it would be completely unarmed. It goes without saying that the proletariat could not consent to such a state of affairs. Hence, the necessity for a new party, a militant party, a revolutionary party, one bold enough to lead the proletarians in the struggle for power, sufficiently expressed to find its bearings amidst the complex conditions of a revolutionary situation and sufficiently flexible to steer clear of all submerged rocks in the path to its goal. Without such a party, it is useless to think of overthrowing imperialism and achieving the achieving the dictatorship of the proletariat. This new party is the party of Leninism. What are the specific features of this new party? One, the party as the advanced detachment of the working class. The party must be, first of all, the advanced detachment of the working class. The party must absorb all the best elements of the working class their experience, their revolutionary spirit, their selfless devotion to the cause of the proletariat. But in order it may really be the armed detachment, the party must be armed with revolutionary theory, with a knowledge of the laws of movement, with a knowledge of the laws of revolution. Without this, it will be incapable of directing the struggle of the proletariat, of leading the proletariat. The party cannot be a real party if it limits itself to registering what the masses of the working class feel and think, if it drags at the tail of the spontaneous movement, if it is unable to overcome the inertia and the political indifference of the spontaneous movement, if it is unable to rise above the momentary interests of the proletariat, if it is unstable, unable to rise the masses to the level of understanding the class interests of the proletariat. The party must stand at the head of the working class. It must see farther than the working class. It must lead the proletariat and not drag at the tail of the spontaneous movement. Parties of the Second International, which preach covotism and vehicles of bourgeois policy, which condemns the proletariat to the role of a tool in the hands of the bourgeoisie, only a party which adopts the standpoint of advanced detachment of the proletariat and is able to raise the masses to the level of understanding the class interests of the proletariat, only such a party can divert the working class from the path of trade unionism and convert it into independent political force. The party is a political leader of the working class. I have spoken of the difficulties of the struggle of the working class, of the complicated conditions of the struggle of strategy and tactics, of reserves of, and manoeuvring of attack and retreat. These conditions are no less complicated, if not more so, than the conditions of war. Who can find his bearings in the conditions who can give correct guidance to the proletarian millions? No army at war can dispense with an experienced general staff if it does not want to court a certain defeat. It is not clear that the proletariat can still less dispense with such a general staff if it does not want to give itself up to be devoured by, by its mortal enemies. But where is the general staff? Only the revolutionary party of the proletariat can serve as this general staff. The working class without a revolutionary party is an army without a general staff. The party is the general staff of the proletariat. But the party cannot be only an advanced attachment. It must at the same time be a detachment of the class, part of the class, closely bound up with it by all fibers of its being. The distinction between the advanced detachment and the rest of the working class, between party members and non-party people, cannot disappear until classes disappear. <coughs> it will exist as long as the ranks of the proletariat continue to be replenished 
with former members of the other classes. As long as the working class as a whole is not in position to rise to the level of advanced detachment, but the party would cease to be a party if this detachment developed into a gap. If the party turned in on itself and become divorced from the non-party masses, the party cannot lead the class if it is not connected with the non-party masses. If there is no bond between the party and the non-party masses, if their masses do not accept its leadership, if the party enjoys no moral and political credit among the masses. Recently, 200,000 new members of, from the ranks of the workers were admitted into our party. Wow. Uh, the very remarkable thing about this is the fact that these people did not merely join the party themselves, but were rather sent there by the main body of non-party workers who took an active part in the work of accepting the new members and without whose approval no new member was accepted. This fact proves that the broad masses of non-party workers regard our party as their party, as a party near and dear to them, in whose expansion and consolidation they are virtually interested and to whose leadership they voluntarily entrust with destiny. It need hardly be proved that without these intangible moral threads which connect the party with the non-party masses, the party could not have become the decisive force of its class. The party is an inseparable part of the working class. I'll just finish this little part here. He goes, we, says Lenin, are the party of a class and therefore almost the entire class. And in times of war, in the period of civil war, the entire class should act under leadership of our party, should adhere to their party as closely as possible. But it would be manolivism and covetism uh, to think that at any time under capitalism, the entire class or almost the entire class would be able to rise to the level of consciousness and activity of its of attachment or its social democratic party. No sens sensible social democrat or uh, communist has ever yet uh, doubted that under capitalism, even the trade union organisations, which are more primitive and more comprehensible to the underdeveloped strata, are unable to do embrace the entire, almost the entire working class. Forget the distinction between the vanguard and the whole masses which gravitate towards it. To forget the constant duty of the vanguard to arise ever wider strata to this most advanced level, mean merely to deceive oneself, in to shut one's eyes to the immensity of our tasks and to narrow down these tasks. From Lenin Collect Works, Volume 11. Mm. Two, the party as the organized attachment of the working class. The party is not the advanced attachment of the working class. If it desires really to direct the struggle of the class, it must at the same time be the organized attachment of its class. The party takes tasks under the conditions of capitalism are immense and extremely varied. The party must direct the struggle of the proletariat under exceptionally difficult conditions of internal and external development. It must lead the proletariat in the offensive when the situation calls for the offensive. It must lead the proletariat so as to escape the blow of a powerful enemy when the situation calls for retreat. It must imbue the millions of unorganized non-party members with the spirit of organization and endurance. But the party can fulfill these tasks only if itself the embodiment of discipline and organization. It is itself the organized detachment of the proletariat. Without these conditions, there can be no question of the party really leading the vast masses of the proletariat. The party is the organized attachment of the working class. The conception of the party as an organized whole is embodied in Lenin's well-known formulation of the first paragraph of our party rules, which the parties regard as the sum of its organizations and the party member as a member of one of the organizations of the party. The Mensheviks, who objected to this formulation as early as 1903, proposed to substitute it for a system of self-enrollment in the party, a system of conferring the title of party member upon every professor and high school student, upon every sympathiser and striker who supported the party in one way or another, but who did not join and did not desire to join any one of the party organisations. It need hardly be proved that had this singular system become firmly entrenched in our party, it would inevitably have led to our parties becoming inundated with professors and high school students and to its degeneration into a loose, amorphous, disorganised formation lost in a sea of sympathisers. 
That would have obliterated the dividing line between the party and the class and would have upset the party's task of elevating the unorganised masses to the level of the vanguard. Needless to say, under such an opportunist system, our party would have been unable to fulfil the role of the organising nucleus of the working class in the course of our revolution. From the point of view of Martov, says Lenin, the borderline of the party remains absolutely vague for every striker may proclaim himself a party member. What is the use of the vagueness? Uh, a, wide, a widespread title. Its term is that it introduces a disorganising idea and confusing the class and the confusing our class and party. But the party is not merely the sum total of party organisations. The party is this is at the same time a single system of these organisations, their formal union into a single whole, with higher and lower leading bodies, with subordination of the minority to the majority with practical decisions binding on all of the members of the party. Without these conditions, the par party cannot be a single, organized, whole, capable of exercising systemic and organized leadership in the struggle of the working class. Formally, says Lenin, our party was not a formally organized whole, but only the sum of separate groups, and therefore no other relations except those of ideological influence were possible between these groups. Now we have become an organized party, and this implies the establishment of authority, the transformation of the power of, the, of, of ideas into the power of authority, the subordination of lower party bodies to the higher party bodies. The print the principle of the minority submitting to the majority, the principle of directing party party work from, an, from a centre not infrequently gives rise to attacks on the part of wavering elements to accusations of bureaucracy, formalism, etc. It need hardly be proved that systematic work by the party as one whole and the directing of the struggle of the working class would have been impossible if these principles had not been adhered to. Leninism in the organisational questions means unserving application of these principles. Lenin turned for fight against these principles. Russian nihilism and aristocratic mannerism deserving only of being ridiculed and, and swept aside. Here is what Lenin says about these wavering elements in his book, One Step Forward. The aristocratic anarchism is particularly characteristic of the Russian nihilist. He thinks of the party organization as a monstrous factory. He regards the subordination of the part to the whole and of the minority to the majority as serfdom, as division of labor under the direction of a center evolves from him a, tra a tragic comical outcry against people being transformed into wheels and cogs. Mention of the organizational rules of the party calls forth the contemptuous grimace and disdainful remark that one could very well dispense with rules altogether. It is clear, I think, the cries about the celebrated bureaucracy are just a scream for dissatisfaction with the personal composition of the central bodies. A fig leaf. You are a bureaucrat because you were appointed by the Congress, not by my will, but against it. You are a formalist because you rely on the formal decisions of the Congress and not on my consent. You are acting in a grossly mechanical way because you plead the mechanical majority as the party Congress and pay no heed to my wish to be co-opted. You are an autocrat because you refuse to hand over the power to the old gang. The gang here referred to that of Alex Mar and others who would not submit to decisions of the Second Congress, who you accuse Lenin of being a bureaucrat. <laughs> Three, the party as the highest form of class organization of the proletariat. The party is the organized detachment of the working class, but the party is not the only organization of the working class. The proletariat has also a number of other organizations without which it cannot properly wage the struggle against capital, trade unions, cooperative societies, factory and works organisations, parliamentary groups, non-party women associations, the press, cultural and educational organisations, youth leagues, revolutionary fighting organisations, in time of open revolution action, Soviets of deputies as the form of state organisation, if the proletariat is in power, etc. The overwhelming majority of these organisations are non-party. 
and only a certain part of them adhere directly to the party or represent its offshoots. All of these organisations under certain conditions are absolutely necessary for the working class, for without them it would be impossible to consolidate the class positions of the proletariat in the diverse fears of struggle. For without them it would be impossible to steal the proletariat as the force whose mission it is to replace the bourgeois order by the socialist order. But now, but how can single leadership be exercised with such an abundance of organisations? What guarantee is there that this muni municipality of organisations will not lead to into divergency in leadership? It might be argued that each of these organisations carry on its work in its own special field, and that therefore these organisations cannot hinder one another. This, of course, is true, but it's also true that all these organisations should work in one direction, for they serve one class, the class of the proletarians. The question then arises, who is to determine the line? The general direction, along with the work of all these organisations, is to be conducted. Where is the central organisation which is not only able, because it has the necessary experience to work out such a general line, but in addition is in a position? because it is, has sufficient prestige for that, to induce all these organisations to carry out this line, so as to attain unity of leadership and to preclude the possibility of work of working across purposes. Uh, mm. because this, I think I have this lost. Order, Just keep going. Yeah, all right. this organisation is the party of the proletariat. Okay, I found it. Um, yep. There, there was slightly different um, translation on the, the last word. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, there, we got a comment here saying, just joined, what text? We're reading Stalin's Foundations of Leninism, um, chapter, I believe chapter, is it seven or eight? Yeah, party. Just before you proceed, Dust, I'm actually mm -hmm. reading from an older text that was printed in, I think, 1945. And then that's the book there. <laughs> in, in Moscow, too. Man, so that's why some some of the words are a little bit different. Some of the sentences change. It happens. Mm. All right. So continuing the reading, um, the party um, possesses all the necessary qualifications for this because, in the first place, it is the rallying center of the finest elements in the working class who have direct connections with the non-party members of the proletariat and very frequently lead them. Because secondly, the party as the rallying center of the finest members of the working class is the best school for training leaders of the working class, capable of directing every form of organization of their class. Because thirdly, the party is the best school for training lead, leads of the working class is, by reason of its experience and prestige, the only organization capable of centralizing the leadership of the struggle of the proletariat thus transforming each and every non-party organization of the working class into an auxiliary body and transmission belt linking the party with the class. The party is the highest form of class organization of the proletariat. This does not mean, of course, that non-party organizations, trade unions, cooperative societies, etc. should be officially subordinated to the party leadership. It only means that the members of the party who belong to these organisations and are doubtlessly influential in them should do all they can to persuade these non-party organisations to draw nearer to the party of the proletariat in their work and to accept voluntary, uh, or to accept voluntarily its political guidance. That is why Lenin says that the party is the highest form of proletarian class organisation. Its political leadership must extend to every other form of organisation of the proletariat. That's how to be selected works volume 10. This is why the opportunist theory of the independence and neutrality of non-party organization, which breeds independent members of parliament and, journal and journalists isolated from the party, narrow-minded trade union leaders, and Philistine cooperative officials, is wholly incom inca incompatible with the theory and practice of Leninism. Four, the party of an instrument of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The party is the highest form of organization of the proletariat. The party is the principal guiding force within the class of proletarians and among the organizations of that class. But it does not, by any means, follow from this that the party can be regarded as an end in itself, as a self-sufficient force. The party is not only the highest form of class association of proletarians, it is at the same time an instrument in the hands of the proletariat for achieving the dictatorship when that has not yet been achieved and for consolidating and expanding the dictatorship when it has already been achieved. 
The party could not have risen so high in importance and could not have exerted its influence over all forms of organizations of the proletariat if the latter had not been confronted with the question of power. If the conditions of imperialism and inevitability of wars and the existence of a crisis had not yet um, demanaged the contract concentration of all forces of the proletariat at one point, the gathering of all the threats of the revolutionary movement in one spot in order to overthrow the bourgeoisie and achieve the dictatorship of the proletariat. The proletariat needs the party first of all as its general staff, which it must have for the successful seizure of power. It scarcely needs proof that without a party capable of rallying around itself, the mass organizations of the proletariat of centralizing the leadership of the entire movement during the progress of the struggle, the proletariat in Russia could not have established its revolutionary dictatorship. Just before I proceed, uh, um, someone made a comment. Is my mic all right? Can you hear me? There's a little enough? bit of uh, there's a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure if there's a fan or there's an echo. Um, should be. I'll just, just just give me a moment. I'll just check. Just let me hear that. Is that better? Um, proceed. We'll, we'll see. Okay. Just on the check. All right. But the proletariat needs the party not only to achieve the dictatorship, it needs it still more to maintain the dictatorship, to consolidate and expand it in order to achieve the complete victory of socialism. Certainly, almost everyone now realises, says Lenin, that the Bolsheviks could not have maintained themselves in power for two and a half months let alone two and a half years, unless there is strictest, truly iron discipline that prevailed in our party. And unless the latter had been re rendered fullest and unreserved support of the whole mass of the working class, that is, all of its thinking, honest, self-sacrificing, influential elements who are capable of leading or carrying them uh, the backward strata. That's from his Selected Works again, Volume 10. I just before I proceed to just for uh, those, some of those views are a bit confused. When they mean the term of dictatorship, it doesn't mean like one person dictating rule it means actual working class power. That's what they're referring to. Yeah. All right, thank mm. you. Now, what does to maintain and expand the dictatorship mean? It means in in booing the millions of proletarians with a spirit of discipline and organization. It means creating among the proletarian masses a cementing force and a bulwark against the coercive influence of the petty bourgeois element, elemental forces, and petty bourgeois habits. It means enhancing the organization work of the proletarians and re-educating and remolding the petty bourgeois strata. It means helping the masses of the proletarians to educate themselves as a force capable of abolishing classes and of preparing the conditions for the organization of socialist production. But it's impossible to accomplish all of this without a party which is strong by reason of its solidarity and discipline. The dictatorship of the proletariat, says Lenin, is a persistent struggle, bloody and bloodless, violent, and peaceful, violent and peaceful, military and economic, educational and administrative against the forces and traditions of the old society, the force of habit of millions and tens of millions of the most terrible force. Without an iron party tempered in the struggle, without a party enjoying the confidence of all that is honest in the given class, without a party capable of watching and influencing the mood of the masses, it is impossible to conduct such a struggle successfully. The proletariat needs the party for the purpose of achieving and maintaining the dictatorship the party as an instrument of the dictatorship of the proletariat. But from this, uh, it follows that when classes disappear and the dictatorship of the proletariat wither away, the party will also wither away. Five, the party is the embodiment of unity of will. Unity in incapable... Inca <laughs> sorry incompatible with the existence of factions. The achievement and maintenance of the dictatorship of the proletariat is impossible without a party which is strong by reason of its solidarity and iron discipline. But iron discipline in the party is inconceivable without unity of will, without complete and absolute unity of action on the part of all members of the, of the party. This does not mean, of course, that the possibility of conflicts of opinion within the party is therefore precluded. On the contrary, iron discipline does not preclude, but presupposes criticism and conflict of opinion within the party. 
Least of all does it mean that the discipline must be blind. On the contrary, iron discipline does not preclude but presupposes conscious and voluntary submission, for only conscious discipline can be truly iron discipline. But after a conflict of opinion has been closed, after criticism has been exhausted and a decision has been arrived at, unity of will, unity of will and unity of action of all party members are the necessary con conditions without which neither party unity nor iron discipline in the party is conceivable. In the present epoch of the acute civil war, says Lenin, a communist party will be able to perform its duty only if it is organized in a centralized manner. Only if iron discipline bordering on military discipline prevails in it, and if its party centre is a powerful and authoritative organ wielding wide powers and enjoying the universal confidence of the members of the party. This is the position in regard to discipline in the party in the period of struggle preceding the achievement of, of a revolution. The same part, but to an even greater degree, must be said about the discipline in the party after the revolution has been achieved. However, says Lenin, Weakens ever so little the iron discipline of the party of the proletariat, especially during the time of the dictatorship, especially aids the, aids the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. But from this, it follows that the existence of factions is is factions is compatible neither with the party's unity nor with its iron discipline. It scarcely needs proof the existence of factions leads to the existence of a number of centers. And the existence of a number of centers means the absence of one common center in the party, the breaking up of unity of will, the weakening and disintegration of discipline, the weakening and disintegration of the party. Of course, the parties of the Second International, which are fighting against the dictatorship of the proletariat and have no desire to lead the proletarians to power, can afford such liberalism as freedoms of factions, for they have no need at all for iron discipline. But the parties of the Communist International, those activities are conditioned by the task of achieving and consolidating the dictatorship of the proletariat, can not afford to be liberal or to permit freedom of factions. The party represents unity of will, which precludes all factionalism and division of authority in the party. Hence, Lenin's warning about the danger of factionalism from the point of view of party unity and of affecting the unity of will of the vanguard of the proletariat is as the fundamental condition for the success of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is embodied in the special resolution, the 10th Congress of our party, one party unity. Hence, and Lenin's demand for the complete elimination of all factionalism and the immediate dissolution of all groups, without exception, that had been formed on the basis of various platforms on pain of unconditional immediate expulsion from the party. Six, the party becomes strong by purging itself of opportunistic elements. The source of factionalism in the party is its opportunistic elements. The proletariat is not an isolated class. It is consistently replenished by the influx of peasants, petty bourgeoisie, and intellectuals proletarianized by the development of capitalism. At the same time, the, the upper strata of the proletariat, principally trade union leaders and members of the proletariat who are fed by the bourgeois out of super profits extracted from the colonies, is undergoing a process of decay. This stratum of bourgeoisified workers, or the labor aristocracy, says Lenin, who are quite philistine in their mode of life, and the size of their earnings, and their entire outlook, is the principal prop of the Second International, and in our days the principal social, not military prop of the bourgeoisie. For they are the real agents of the bourgeoisie and the working class movement, the labor lieutenants of the capitalist class, real channels of reformism and chauvinism. In, in one way or another, all these petty bourgeois groups penetrate into the party, introduce into it the spirit of hesitancy and opportunism, the spirit of demoralization and, uh, and uncertainty. It is they, principally, the, they constitute the source of factionalism and disintegration, the source of disorganization and disruption of the party from within. To fight imperialism with such allies in one's rear means to expose oneself to the danger of being caught between two fires, 
from the front and from the rear. Therefore, ruthless struggle against such elements, their expulsion from the party is a prerequisite for the, for the successful struggle against imperialism. The theory of defeating opportunist elements by the ideological struggle within the party, the theory of overcoming these elements within the confines of a single party, is a rotten and dangerous theory, which threatens to condemn the party to paralysis and chronic infirmity, threatens to leave the party a prey to opportunism, threatens to leave the proletariat without a revolutionary party, threatens to deprive the proletariat of its main weapon in the fight against imperialism. Our party could not have emerged onto the broad highway. It could not have seized power and organized the dictatorship of the proletariat. It could not have emerged victorious from the Civil War if it had within its ranks like Martov and Dan and Prestov and Alex Rod. Our party, our party succeeded in achieving internal unity and unexampled coercion of its ranks primarily because it was able in good time to purge itself of opportunistic pollution, because it was able to rid its ranks of liquidators and Mensheviks. Proletarian parties develop and become strong by purging themselves of opportunists and reformists, social imperialists, social sovereignists, social patriots, and social pacifists. The party becomes stronger by purging itself of opportunistic elements. With reformists, Mensheviks in our ranks, says Leonard, it is impossible to achieve victory of the proletarian revolution. It is impossible to retain it. That is obvious in principle, and it is, has been strikingly confirmed by the experience both of Russia and hun Hungary. In Russia, difficult situations have risen many times when the Soviet regime would most certainly have the Soviet government would have most certainly been overthrown had Mensheviks, reformists, and petty bourgeois Democrats remained in our party. In Italy, as is generally admitted, decisive battles between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the possession of state power, are imminent. At such a moment, it is not only absolutely necessary to remove the Mensheviks, reformists, and terrorists from the party, but it may even be useful to remove excellent communists who are liable to waver and have revealed a tendency to waver towards unity with the reformists to remove them from all responsible posts. On the eve of a revolution and a moment when a most fierce struggle is being waged for, the, for its victory, a slight wavering in the ranks of the party may wreck everything, frustrate the revolution, wrest the power of the hands of the proletariat, oh, sorry, wrest power from, uh, wrest the power from the hands of the pro proletariat. For this power is not yet consolidated. The attack upon it will be very strong. The retirement of wavering leaders at such a time does not weaken but strengthens the party, the working class movement, and the revolution. Mm. Very wow. powerful, positive stuff. Um, for those who joined us while we were reading, um, we just finished reading J.V. Stalin's The Foundations of Leninism, um, the chapter on the the party, um, chapter seven, I'm sorry, chapter eight, chapter eight, the party. Uh, my initial responses are, as always, I'm just blown away at how dedicated, poignant, um, precise, disciplined, um, effectively communicated um, Stalin's writings are. Mm. Um, and just think about what they did um, coming to power. And then maintaining power, going, seeing unprecedented um, industrialization, becoming a world superpower within a number of years, um, within a number, literally a number of years, less than a decade. Um, I, I it just, it's absolutely beautiful. And it's some of the first things that come to my mind um, when reading this is how detached our current movement. Um, it is from this, you know, I, I look at this, um, this anti-work um, position and it's true that work under capitalism is, is slavery. It's horrible. It's disgusting. You know, we, we feel this task, we feel this humanized, but socialism isn't, we're just going to lay around and do nothing and, you know, and live off some entity, you know, it, it, to be able to create abundance from socialism, it takes hard work and dedication and sacrifice. And 
you know, I'm not, I'm not really, really seeing that, you know, the, Lenin was, we're giving our, our whole lives to the revolution and the party. And they were able to do these great things through, for, through discipline, um, understanding, um, and respect. And it's the working class. It's the, 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 I, so I got to go, you know, I work, you know, 12 hours a day. I, I get up in the morning. I do this. I deal with a number of people. I do it a number of issues and it's that work. That enables me to be disciplined, to cut out the bullshit. It's mm. the, you know, it's the philistine petty bourgeois who, who don't have to do the work of the proletariat that becomes soft and are allowed to sit around and contemplate, you know, all, all this stuff that has no regards for, for what's actually, you know, what's actually taking place. Um, mm. com- Comrade Fox, what's um, your initial response to the piece? Yeah, I mean, look, that's um, it's certainly a lot of look. It is a quite an excellent chapter. Uh, understand the role of party and also to how it came into being and why they had to be a particular way at a certain career at some very critical times, both on um, pre revolutionary, revolutionary, post revolutionary. Um, and there was like, I have to admit, during the Civil War after the Russian Revolution, uh, the war and intervention. It had to be uh, top down for some time. They were in, they were in a state state of war. They had to actually defend their revolution um, and 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 their and their first successful win. And they had to beat off fourteen different countries. Um, so obviously you would have had that strict command uh, structure during times of rebuilding and that. Uh, and so, but everyone has input uh, input as well. But this is to understand. I mean, one thing that he did uh, and did emphasize: they didn't crush debate. They didn't discuss difference of opinion. They encouraged it actually, and they and they debated. They made sure everything was thoroughly researched and debated further discussion. But the decision, but the decisions were collective decisions, and the collective decision was binding. Um, that's it. So people made this is what we're going to do. The decision was binding, and the party carried it out. And obviously, at times, their things had to be redressed. And that's and it worked, and it was certainly it worked very well for that period. Where unlike some other parties of the, the Second International, they were based on factions different groups and everything else. and basically all it was was just down within a form of parliamentary struggle and what and what 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 concessions they can gain out of the current system of imperialism which was not not so fair you know but just some interesting parallels to to today although our mr our material conditions and um, certainly changed since then um obviously as well and i thought actually too, i just want to emphasize about the non-party organizations unions were mentioned but many others cooperatives under that i well, understand i know there's been debates and i know there's some uh, people out there call themselves marxist leninist or whatever and they're really skating of unions and cooperatives and everything else but what understanding these that they're basic forms of working class organization just basic Right, um, unions was probably set up where groups of workers had common interest to fight some of the worst excesses of capital. They had also gained some concessions to improve their lives. And look, that's a basic form of struggle, very basic form of struggle when you think about it. But for us, role and what what Arnold Lennon were referring to here was okay. These non-party organisers, what we do, how we develop them to a higher levels of ideology and struggle, from lower to higher levels. Three, there's three levels of forms of struggle: economic, political, and ideological. And how we develop it now for union sort of thing, or for us, not going to be denunciating them more every five seconds and and saying every union leader is a bureaucrat and, a, and labour aristocracy. That's the incorrect thing to do. What we have to do is turn them into schools of class struggle, into schools of communism. Socialism, communism, and each of those workers not only the ability to fight, but also how they can ability to run things as well. Because practically, workers run everything anyway. Um, they're, they're quite capable of running things by themselves, without bosses, but they and they run things anyway. But they've got to come to that realization. So it develops from both the uh, economic, political to the ideological struggle. Yeah, and same with the cooperatives as well. Cooperatives, uh, so cooperatives themselves are not socialist organisations or nations, but they're a step forward, obviously. But how we're going to develop those cooperatives to the lower, the higher levels of organisation, and that's and that, 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 that's what it burns. I wish I had the chart to show you that three forms of organisation. So this is where these things. But what 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 uh, what was mentioned in here about the trade union ideology? What it means is what's why we've got to try because under capitalism, how we're going to develop those workers to just from a trade union consciousness, but to a working class consciousness, and to realise that this, it's the system itself that needs changing. We can win, yes, we can win concessions out of the system at times, 
but we need to go that one step further and get rid of the system that's um, our misery in the first place. So that's what I wanted to throw it out there. I want to respond to this um, comment here um, from Stephen Clary. Looks like what's going on in Canada with the truckers 40 miles long about the mandates. Talk about solidarity. Great modern day protest and United States workers are supporting it. Um, actually, just today, um, early today, I recorded a session with Canadian um, communists from the uh, Asian immigrant uh, disas diaspora, comrade B-level on the Ewoks Unhinged, and we'll be talking about that struggle um, more in depth. It will be released, um, I think, later this week on this channel if you want to check it out. If I can just give a brief summary of, of, of what's going on there. Um, there is a lot of right-wing forces um, manipulated, a lot of right-wing money that's coming into it um, that's trying to manipulate it. But at the heart of it, this is um, small businesses who are angry about the, the classist discrimination and the COVID rollout. And I think they're rightfully angry. And they're angry at the monopoly capitalist system and government. And I think we should support them. And we should go to them and we should raise the property question like we do with everything. And I, I do see a lot of support here um, as well. And I think it's positive. And I, I, I um, appreciate you, you raising that. Now, um, as far as going back to the material, I just want to say, so just because um, democratic centralism in a strict sense was what was necessary in Russia at the time, does that mean that's what's necessary now? Good question. Mm -hmm. And the end, I would say the answer is no. Um, if we look at, you know, what has worked in recent history, it is more broad, anti um, neoliberal, anti imperialist coalitions that put Hugo Chavez in the power, that put Evo Morales in power in Bolivia, that, that has put socialist and anti imperialist in the power has been these broad coalitions it hasn't been a singular party um democratic central party and a lot of the democratic central parties in the united states you know in the age of internet have been you know have been very become very detached from the masses and they've become these one leader cults um and they've lost their ability to you know to have necessary debate because they're distanced from the masses. If you don't have, you know, if you don't have these, these democratic transition belt organizations hooked to the masses of people, you can never really serve the people. And if you can't serve the people, you'll never have the power to take power, mm. you know? So, and that explains a lot of what's going on. But so how do we do that? I don't know, but there, there's, there's insight um, in what we did and we can use that logic, not necessarily, the absolute tactics of what they did now they did then we can use that logic and that understanding to make better assessments um, of our current time and i just want to talk about how this information has been used and is being used throughout history if we look at i often say that the 1920s 30s and 40s communist party of the united states um, had hundreds of thousands of members but in reality consisted of millions of people. And when I say that, I mean, the party, it, it, the, that party operated just like the party in Russia um, under democratic centralism. You know, not everyone's a party member, only the most dedicated, only the people who are willing to sacrifice themselves and give to the entire cause. Those are the party members. And then you have people in union organizations and community organizations who are, you know, the broader masses of the party that are fighting within those interests. And then that, the party member is part of those interests. And, you know, and that's what feeds into the party and helps the central make its decisions. Um, and that is exactly what happened. And that's why I say, you know, there was, there was hundreds of thousands of members, but millions of people in, in effect effectually that were part of the communist party in the United States. Um, and then after the McCarthy era and the, the, um, the rising of the, you know, labor aristocracy and other elements um, and different conditions, 
we no longer had a mass party. Now, mm. what's another example of a party that's operating on this to this day is the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party is nearly is 90 million members. And often when I get told, I get told by uh, when I say I support China, I support what they're doing. I, they're bringing about socialism. They're pushing the world towards socialism. They're developing the world um, through their Belt and Road Initiative. I say, well, aren't they un, aren't they undemocratic? Well, I'm well, they certainly don't um, have some of the um, freedoms we have in the United States. Um, and that's true. We live in the you know, uh, we have a lot of material wealth here. Um we're not under attack constantly from the United States. Um, we're not trying to, we don't have these guidelines of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and improving infrastructure. It's just kind of like do whatever you want, you know, in, in, in the West, at least for, you know, people with money, <laughs> what have you. So I get told, so isn't the Chinese communist party undemocratic because only 6% of the population I'm not sure that's an exact figure, but somewhere around there is actually party members. And the answer is no. The party members are the most advanced, most dedicated. And mind you, there's there's people, there's members of the Communist Party in every neighborhood and every block and every society. There's Uyghur members of mm. the Chinese Communist Party. And Tibetan um, ones too. And Tibetan is, and, and, you know, and they are dedicated to their communities, sir, of, for, and by their communities. You know, and then that party influences these huge mass organizations, the um, the the nationalized banking system, the, the 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 cooperatives, the unions. All of these have communist members in them and are in, you know, working directly in coordination with the with the central party to benefit and to benefit the country, you know. And we're talking about how, you know, that system is more democratic. The rank and file members of the Communist Party have real say over the Senate. We compare that to the United States with Democrats and Republicans. Sure, everyone's a member of the Democratic and Republican Party. If you if you register, you're a member of that party. But what real say do you have over that central? Nothing. Both of those parties are absolutely controlled by the monopoly capitalist interest. We have no say over it whatsoever. And in China, not only do the, the 90 million member part. Um, members have say over the central committee, the, the leaders in the organizations in, in the nationalized bank, in, um, the, in the cooperatives, in the unions, they, their ideas are, and their material condition, their needs are also took into consideration by the central of the party. Hmm. And actually just want to add to a couple of things there. Look, they they do have um they do have debate and they do have discussion and difference of opinions in in the Senate and the Communist Party of China. I mean, it's just scientifically and physically impossible that everyone will have the same opinion and agree on everything. And they have it. They 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 debate and discuss things in a mannerism completely different from uh, you know Western liberal culture would we live in under the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc. So I mean that's yeah. it. And they are out there. They're in touch with the regular communities and all that every day. So that's one thing. Also, too, here's another little interesting fact. In, ta in Taiwan, uh, the Communist Party of China exists there as well. And they're actually quite, they're, they're not a small little party. They're quite big. And yes, their policy is to completely reunify with uh, mainland China. I bet you didn't know that. I know the Kuomintang uh, retreated there. And obviously, they, they also had a one China policy as well. But yes, the Com Communist Party of China, uh, they actually put some of the older flags they use and they and they actually go out and do rallies um, and protests on streets and all that. They're actually still quite vibrant in Taiwan. So I just wanted to throw uh, put that in there. And same, they're also active in Hong Kong. And these were Hong Kong. They weren't just people from mainland China coming into Hong Kong. These are Hong Kong um, based people. There's um, a Communist Party of China there too. So it, it just comes to show you how, how big and broad um, how big of a party is. And look, uh, our democratic centralism were would work today. I mean, look, this is good. Fundamental question was because the whole actually this whole chapter when it's talking about this, how's it apply for us today? And um, keeping that in within the context. I mean, the second international is long gone. Um, obviously, you know, Russia, you know, the Soviet Union's been was deliberately dismantled in the early nineties, and I'll say deliberately dismantled. Um, and and all these other things, but these are lessons to be learned from. 
Um, I've, I've been in discussion. Look, I, I mean, look, I think deep down we'd all love to have a revolutionary party, um, you know, a communist party um, and proper ones in their respective countries, but we're not there there yet. And I've always tended to believe it needs to be born out of struggle. It can't be just, oh, let's get, get together and form a party. I mean, there's about... I don't know. <laughs> the list just gets longer and longer and longer and longer amount of parties out there. So I, I think what we're doing with cells, with uh, with you guys in the US, with the Centre of Political Revation, we've kicked off Australians for a new democracy here. We're bringing people together. I mean, we're, when a party does arise, it will arise. You know, I don't know when, I don't know how, but it, it will rise. It will rise out of, but I know, oh, actually, no, I'll say how, it will rise out of struggle and and, and necessity for one. And how will that be organised? Could be completely different from what Lenin had to say and what's to be done. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Yes, uh, very, very positive. Um, so, so I just, maybe I can talk a little bit about, so why is the Centre for Political Innovation a think tank and not a party? The same with... Um, Australians for a new democracy and, th- and congratulations on Thank finally you. on finally forming that. I'm very excited. Um, yep. This this show itself is is largely a a you know <laughs> this is somewhat a dirty word, but a front organization. This is kind of a mass organization um, of you know the think tank and and of Center for Political Innovation. So why is it a party and not why is it a think tank and not a party? Well, to be a party, you have to have, you know, the, the, it has to be the people's party. You can't be a party of a few intellectuals, a party of a few rebels, a party of a few adventurists. If you are going to be a party, you actually have to represent the needs and the wills of the people. And to be able to need to represent the needs and the wills of people. You have to have those democratic transition belts. You got the, the people need to, you know, need to be almost in a, not in a revolutionary state, but the conditions have to be right on top of that. Not only the conditions yeah. have to be right, um, we can't have tailism. Um, it talked about you can't like a lot of the parties um, today will go out to the liberal protest cage and they'll, they'll go to the Black Lives Matter. Um, they'll go to these important struggles. They say, we're here, we support you, and we're communists. Now, what are they doing other than, you know, supporting um, a space that's being heavily influenced by CIA money and by Democratic NGOs, you know, to fight for one section of the bourgeoisie? You know, that, that's not what we need to do. We need to understand, be a part of the people, and mm. the people need to be educated to a certain extent. Um, to to, to want to you know be under that condition. So I think at this point, not 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 only can we not call ourselves a party um, because we don't actually represent the people, um, mm. and that and you know, so what do we call ourselves a party builder organization? Now, and I've been part of democratic centralist party builder organizations, and honestly, the discipline of democratic centralism, if done correctly. Um, can be very positive and very and very uh, very effective. You can have a democratic, a small democratic centralist party builder organization that can work in the union movement, that can work in the mass movement, and then using the skills of self criticism, using the the principles of having uh, fractions, not factions. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can then um, have different bodies of that group who study. And who come together on a central body and make decisions, focus on, you know, that particular union, a particular cause, and then report back to that democratic centralist organization. And I think that can be that can be effective. And if people are looking, I, I know CPU, what is it, um, Party of Communist USA, um, if there's any members of Party of Communist USA, I believe that's how they're trying. That's what they're trying to do. And I wish them success. I'm not particularly um, a part of that. And I wish them success. But let's talk about Center for Political Innovation. And why is the focus on, you know, the ideological, on the teaching? And I think if we want to get to the point where we have a party um, with the rapidly changing conditions, we've got to get to the masses. That is the key ingredient. If you look at all these failed parties, um, all these little isolated cult groups that are completely isolated from the masses, why have they been degenerated into these, 
little cult groups. Well, a big portion is they're stuck in these liberal spaces just out, just outside the university. Um, they're dis, they're detached from the general work urban working class as well as especially the rural working class. They're completely detached. I think if we if we want to start the building of something of the coalition of the part whatever is going to bring history forward. We've got to get to the masses. We got to build infrastructure about, uh, among the masses, and we need and people every day because of these worsening conditions are becoming dissatisfied and dis disillusioned um, with this society. And I believe through a number of fights, a number of ideological struggles, we can go to the masses, raise the property question, um, be involved in um, in mutual aid efforts and and union work. Uh, a number of different issues, and we can use that, bring people up against the capitalist and bring people into revolutionary consciousness and elevate re revolutionary consciousness. I know I said a lot and it's kind of vague and it's, it's, it's kind of big and out there, but this is yeah. the best of my understanding. And I'm honestly giving it out to people. And if so people want to comment or feedback, I'd love it. Any response, Comrade Fox? Yeah, look, here's the thing, right? I mean, the fact is, Oh, even an experience in Australia. I mean, with the parties, democratic centralism works as, as there's a lot of respect and a lot of positive energy and it's empowering as well. It doesn't work when you've got a culture that's toxic, noxious, and it just doesn't, it's not Marxist at all. There's nothing about it. Um, in fact, if it's not, and it doesn't work if it's not connected to the ordinary, ordinary people, ordinary working families and ordinary working people. If it's not connected to their struggle. It's obviously going to fall to bits. It, what it has just comes a little cult, um, you know. We, you know, everyone has to, cannot question what's up above. If you do, you're sort of on the outer and all that sort of thing. Um, people are fighting. You know, it's a power struggle with Uggers. He's got control of the finances and the money and etc. Uh, etc. Et you know, and obviously, you know, it's not. There's nothing you know, unique to Australia. It's happened to a lot of countries around the world. It just comes out of touch and it's unnecessary. Um, so what we're trying to do is encourage everyone, and also too, when, Pete, when you join a party, all right, you have to accept the a program of the party straight away. And it might be some things you quietly correct correct with that either. The program could be completely outdated, or you know, it's just so devoid from everyday reality. So how are you going to defend something like that? Two, I mean, look, a lot of times this is a great way. Of what we're doing about it is an introduction. This is a great way to bring you in to understand what Marxism, Leninism is. Keep in mind, we're not in the late 1800s, early 1900s anymore, right? We're, the world has moved on. How we do things differently, and then, look, Dust has correctly pointed out, you look at countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua, just two classic examples, China's different, Cuba, all that. It, how we go about things will be probably will be different from what Lenin does. There is no actual blueprint that you must follow this line to obviously achieve socialism. That is, it doesn't work. It's not, it's dogmatic and doesn't even work i know there's for certain people on uh, there's one particular uh, youtube personality who shall remain unnamed at the moment um but he, he and i just see what he does and he and a cook and a few of his um, cohorts as well i mean it's just like they just don't seem to get it um at all that we're in it and we have to work we have to work under the current modern material conditions that we live under now and that's what we've got um yeah, and well, you know, some people ask, well, you know, what's what's the point there? You know, revolution's not in the horizon. Well, maybe not yet. It's not yet. But who's to say? I'm not. I'm, you know, things change very quickly, and actually, it's been a very interesting last few years. I can tell you that. I mean, COVID's come along and speeded things up a bit. But you know, but people are questioning the system. They are questioning the system. So as material conditions change. People, um, people's conditions change. Uh, people's thinking changes too. A lot of kids in the, in the background are arguing on this. Here, yeah, they're revolutionary uh, chanting now. See, they are. <laughs> so, understanding that, 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 this is what we're, we're we're learning now. And obviously, what, what, when this was written in the context, but this was out of coal face in the trenches. One guts type of experience that they wrote through. Um, there was endless debates with people with different ideologies um, and that about moving forward. Um, and they obviously really showed what they did was the correct way for, for Russia at that time. And that's what they did. And yes, they laid the model for, for many respective communist parties there, there on through the communist internationally because they had to do so at that time. That's what the material conditions required them 
down for them for them to do. So let's just to keep all that in mind. Actually, to, just um, a couple of things with the different ideologies in there. We, uh, we, we've heard we've heard about anarchism and uh, we've talked about other things like social democracy and that. Look, I would also highly recommend, comrades, there are some great readings. Mark's wrote some interesting articles on that and I'll see Lennon and in Stalin as well. Um, but also, too, um, Kropotkin. Uh, who was an anarchist, but he was actually close with Lenin. And there's actually a Moscow um, subway station named after him. He was anarchist, but he wrote a collective work. So even if you look at his views, um, but it was interesting, uh, just some, some of the arguments that were coming around at that time, um, they're coming about completely different from where we are today. Um, and obviously, too, you're going to be finding yourself in all sorts of organisations in sort of trends with some very odd fellas from everyone from different ideologies at times, so all different things. But the main thing is you understand it and you know what, understand what you're doing um, and being supported by others and engaging with others and that and and building up that experience even more. I'll leave that. Sorry, Dustin. Didn't mean to go on for too long there. No, that's fine. That's fine. We're approaching the, the end of the show. We're going, mm. what a good read. Um, what a what a great text. And I believe we, we've made some um, contributions of trying to apply this um, to our, our current era. Um, before I go into my conclusion, I'd like to do a few housekeeping remarks. Um, I recently took on employment that has more hours, and i am also been neglecting my anti-imperialist America show. So from now on, the Working Class Revolt show is going to be bi-weekly. So our next show, um, if the schedules are right, will probably be the 12th, or, or that the 5th, I'm not sure. Yeah, that will be the 12th of, of February will be our next show. Um, we're, 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 we've only got one more chapter on this left. Um, I'm not sure when we're going to schedule that. I'm not sure if we're going to schedule that the 12th or we're, we're going to have a panel discussion on the 12th. Not sure what we're going to do, but we're we're going to be doing this uh, bi-weekly from now on. And yep. you're also going to see me put some more dedication into anti-imperialist America as well. Um, any any response to that before I go into conclusion? Oh, look, no. I mean, look, everyone said we are all busy. I mean, I, I understand about working long hours. I, I'm exactly, I know what it's like. Um, I've been in both uh, my capacity as a boilermaker, but even as a union organiser, I know you're doing long days and come the evening, you just want to rest and not take it easy. You may want to listen to videos or little podcasts or whatever, but I mean, it's like actually do when you're pretty tired and you need to have that time up. So that's all it is. We're still continuing and I look by, by weekly is fine. Fine. Oh, sorry, not by week. Every fortnight's fine by me. Um, you know, because that actually frees me up. I could be uh, too. I know that means we'd put a little bit more energy in um to Australia for a new democracy, which you know, will be an exciting project up ahead. And actually, if any of you uh, comrades in Australia are listening to this or any friends you're interested, uh, just drop us a line on my Facebook page. Um, yeah, just on Facebook Messenger or Twitter Messenger, and just say, yeah, if you're interested, I'll certainly endeavour to get in touch with you. All right, so in conclusion, um, I need everybody listen to this. Everybody that's watching this, I, you know, it is of utmost importance that you find a way to get away from this toxic culture um, mm. that we're living in. That tells us that nihilism um, was, was mentioned here. Um, nihilism, apathy. Um, destructive thoughts towards yeah. your community and yourself are rampant. Exactly. Um, deaths of despair yeah. are up. Dro people are getting into drugs. And we have got to reject that. Um, there's yeah. this inner light and fire and passion and desire. And each and every one of us. I don't know. This might be some of my Christianity speaking. This might be, you know, um, the, the communist. The power comes from the masses. Um, coming out, but there's something I believe in every single person watching. There's something powerful in you, ready to be unleashed, and you, you should not let the enemy, the culture of the enemy, destroy it. Yeah. You need to stand up and try to do something about it, and you can do something about it. And I and you know things are getting worse. People need you. The future needs you. Um, I please join the Center for Political Innovation. Um, there's there's a big meeting going down in Austin 
um, in March. You can look into that. Look on the CPI um, website. People are getting out to the masses. People are giving constructive, positive message uh, of socialism. And if you're not a fan of the CPI, join an organization. Get involved. Whether you, what, what, regardless of what information, regardless of what organization you want to join, the power comes from the people. And you've got to get to the masses. Talk to your coworkers. Talk, talk to your neighbors. Talk to your family members. And, and look at where they're coming from. You know, don't just, oh, I, I, you know, I'm a Marxist, I'm this, I'm that, and just try to shove it all at them. Look, look at what they're in a revolutionary organization, in the party builder democratic central organization I was a part of. Um, we would fill out monthly reports. And in those monthly report, we say, what are the issues facing me in my community? What are the issues facing me in my workplace? And that was that democratic um, power. That's the democratic of democratic centralism that allowed the central organization to make that body. So when you do outreach to people, you are preaching, but you're not preaching at them. You're talking with them and you're getting information back from them about what it is they need and what we need to do to go forward. It, it, it is, it's not, you know, they're a blank slate. You're working with them. You're serving the masses. And when we can get, we can serve the masses, understand the masses, where they're coming from. We can organize the people and we can escape this nightmare that neoliberalism, um, imperialism is offering. And we can join the rest of the world in building up infrastructure and providing a better lives for ourselves. Um, hmm. Comrade Fox, um, closing remarks. Well, at least I, no, I think that's it. Hopefully, right, guys. If you if you get leveled up in all the toxic culture that's out there, I mean, I touched on it within the parties, but that's also a expression, a reflection of what's happening out in the real world, and we do need to actually stop that. We need to get, we well, need to totally reject that. It is positive. Things change. Do you think honestly, all our forebears that wanted uh, that change, that actually did the hard fighting and, and actually um, fought for changes? Did you think they sat around and sulking and thinking it was give up or despair? No, they did not. Um, otherwise, you know, we'd be in a terrible different discussion of what we are now. What I've done, uh, just for your information, um, there's two links I put up. The one for Australians for a New Democracy, that's the link to the website there. Uh, I've put that up there. And then um, obviously it's called Life Sovereignty Peace. That's under a similar slogan. We use a catchphrase to uh, land peace and bread. Well, that's where that came from, so Life Sovereignty Peace. And then for Centre of Political Innovation, that's the link to there as well. So cpiusa.org. Um, and uh, feel free to go on onto those sites. So, yeah, for your information, write them down. Uh, yep, and be in touch with them. You can certainly send, send them emails and that to obviously someone from those two uh, respective organisations will be in touch. But obviously, look, you know, I think we, yeah, I think there is hope on the on the horizon. We, we can see the struggle intensifying all over the world against imperialism in one form or the other. Uh, it might, might not be local so so much in your own immediate area, but it will happen, um, and it's got to go look for it. But uh, other, otherwise, yeah, if you want to team up any uh, like-minded people, follow those links. Um, yeah, be in touch. All right, I guess we'll yeah. end it with our our usual um, chant. Uh, raise your fist and, and repeat after me, comrade. Dare to struggle. Dare to struggle. Dare to win. Dare to win. All power to the people. All power to the people. All Thank the best, you, everyone. everyone.